ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا وسيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد so in the last lecture that we did we discussed the da'wa of the messengers and that from the very beginning from the first of the messengers all the way till the end to the last of the messengers all of their da'wa was exactly the same in terms of the tawheed that they all called to every single prophet and messenger preaching to his people to worship Allah alone and to abandon the worship of all others besides him as it mentions in the Quran in several places how the prophets and messengers used to say to their people يا قوم اعبدوا الله ما لكم من اله غيره O people worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for indeed you do not have any other deity to worship besides him so this message of tawhid it is the fundamental of this religion the same message that every single prophet and messenger came with And that is why the five pillars of Al-Islam, the head of them is the Shahada. La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah. This is the foundation of the religion to testify that there is no deity worthy of worship in truth except Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that Muhammad is the servant and messenger of Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. As a Muslim, it is important for all of us to understand the exact meaning of La ilaha illallah, the exact meaning of the shahada. That there is no deity worthy of worship in truth except Allah. What does that mean exactly? What does it mean when you break it down? What does La ilaha illallah mean to a Muslim? That is something we should all know. The reality of La ilaha illallah is... The Tawheed that we have been talking about, La ilaha illallah, it is highlighting that exact Tawheed because within this Shahada, you notice that there are two parts. There are two parts in the Shahada. La ilaha illallah. There is no deity worthy of worship in truth, illallah, except Allah. So you have two parts. In one part, you are negating that any other deity has any right to worship in truth. But then you are affirming in the other part that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala He alone has that right to be worshipped. And that is very important to understand. That the shahada is made up of those two parts. One part you are rejecting the worship of all others. The other part you are affirming it to Allah alone. Because tawheed is built exactly on two parts. For tawheed... To be good and proper and correct and actualized. Then it is upon those two parts. And nafi wal ithbat. The affirmation and negation. So you affirm the worship to Allah. 
and you negate it from all others besides Allah. So if somebody says to you now, what is the meaning of Tawheed that you've been saying all of the prophets and messengers, they came with the message of Tawheed. What exactly is Tawheed? What exactly is La ilaha illallah? Then you can say, Tawheed, it means to make something single and unique. To make something single and unique. That is what Tawheed is. To make something one. To make something unique. To single something out. When we talk about the Tawheed of Allah, then of course we are talking about singling out Allah alone for worship. All of that worship of yours uniquely to Allah alone. But how exactly do you even do that? How exactly are you supposed to make your worship purely and singled out and unique to Allah? That's when the two parts come in. You need to have affirmation and you need to have negation. Meaning, there's an example that a Sheikh al uthaymin gave to explain this point. This point of affirmation and negation. He said, imagine now there were in the next room, for example, three people. There are three people in that next room. Khalid, Muhammad, Ali. And I tell you, from those three in that next room, Khalid, Muhammad and Ali, Khalid is standing up. Three of them in that room, Khalid, Muhammad, Ali, Khalid, he's standing up in the room. So now how many of them are standing up in that room? There's three of them all together in there. I've told you Khalid is standing up. How many of them are standing up in the room then? Khalid. So one. One person is standing up in that room. We can't see them, but three of them are in there. And I've told you Khalid is standing up. So I've given you an affirmation. I have affirmed that Khalid is standing up. I've given you an affirmation. Is that affirmation enough to definitively say that Khalid is the only one standing up in the room? Have we made Khalid single and unique in the act of standing up? What if I say to you there's three people standing up in the room actually? Would there be a problem in my statement? Not at all. I said Khalid is standing up. Did I so far negate that Muhammad and Ali are standing up? No. So is it possible those two were standing up too? Absolutely. All I did was affirm that Khalid is standing up definitely. I didn't negate that the other two are standing up. Maybe they are too. So I haven't made Khalid single and unique in the act of standing up by simply giving you an affirmation that he's standing up. How can I make it single and unique to him being the only one standing up? I would have to give you the affirmation. Khalid is standing up in there. And I would have to give you Negation and Muhammad and Ali are not standing up. Now if I say to you in that room that you can't see, how many of them are stood up? Now you can say one. Because I have affirmed and I have negated the rest. Now by affirming and negating, when you put it together, affirmation, Khalid is standing up. Negation, Muhammad and Ali are standing up. Therefore, only Khalid, single and unique, is the one standing up. Now you have Tawheed. You've now made him single and unique in the act of standing up. But if I only gave you affirmation, three of them in the room, Khalid, Muhammad, Ali, Khalid is standing up. 
How many are standing up? Maybe it's just Khalid, but maybe it's two of them. Maybe it's all three of them. There's no singleness and uniqueness yet. What about the other way? If I say Khalid, Muhammad, Ali in the room, Khalid, Muhammad, Ali, none of them are standing up. How many standing up now? Zero. Because I've just given you an absolute negation. I didn't give you any affirmation. So you see, in order to make Khalid, for example, the one standing up, him alone, as the only one standing up in the room, I must give you the affirmation of that. And at the same time, I must give you negation about the others. That then makes him single and unique, standing up alone. Affirmation, negation. Now when you look at the shahada, La ilaha illallah. There is no deity worthy of worship in truth. That is a negation. There is no deity worthy of worship in truth. Negation. Illallah, except Allah. That is affirmation. I have now affirmed that there is only one deity worthy of worship in truth. That is Allah. And I've negated any other deity having the right to be worshipped in truth. Therefore, I now have Tawheed. I have now singled out Allah as the only one deserving of worship. I have negated it from all others. That is how Tawheed works. If somebody comes along to you now, and they say to you that they believe Allah is the creator, Allah is the provider. Allah is the one who gives life and death. Allah is the one who controls all of the universe. That person is upon Tawheed or not? Yes? He has given you what so far? Everything he has said were affirmations. He affirmed Allah is the creator. He affirmed Allah is the one who gives life and death. He affirmed Allah is the one who controls the universe. He gave you all affirmations. We just said, Tawheed doesn't become Tawheed until you give an affirmation and negation. Because what if he then says, he believes Allah is the creator, affirmation. He believes Allah is the one who gives life and death, affirmation. He believes Allah is the one who controls the universe, affirmation. But then he says, he also believes though that it's okay to go and make dua at the graves and the dead people and to go to the idols and the statues. You can still do that though. He's given you affirmation about all of those things, but has he given you negation about others? Mushrikun at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, what did they used to do? Exactly that. Did they not used to affirm affirmation that Allah is the creator? They did. The mushrikun at the time of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, they used to give affirmation. Yes, Allah is the Creator. Who is the one who gives life and death? They would give you affirmation. Allah is the one who gives life and death. Who is the one who controls the universe? They would give you affirmation. Allah is the one who controls the universe. So how come they want Muslims? Because they only gave affirmations when it came to asking them. Do you also negate all the other deities? Then they said, no. When the Prophet ﷺ said to them, قُولُوا لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ تُفْلِحُ The Prophet ﷺ said to them in that case, say لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ Say that there is no other deity worthy of worship and truth except Allah only then. You're saying, you're affirming Allah is the creator, the provider, the sustainer, one who gives life and death. Then give us the affirmation and negation then that only Allah has the right to be worshipped, no other deity. Did they do it? They wouldn't. They wouldn't. They said, أَجَعَلَ الْآلِهَةَ إِلَهًا وَاحِدًا هَذَا لَا شَيْءٌ عُجَابٌ Has he made all of our gods into just one? He wants us to worship just one? That's strange. So you see, they used to give affirmation Allah is the creator. 
Affirmation Allah is the provider. Affirmation Allah is the one who gives life and death. But did they negate their other deities? They did not. Therefore they were not upon Tawheed. Tawheed, you affirm the rights of Allah and you single out Allah with them by negating them from all others. But if you're going to affirm them to Allah, but then also affirm them to others, then have you done any Tawheed? Then all you've done is like we did at the beginning. Three of them in the room, Khalid, yes, I affirm he's standing up. Are you making Tawheed of him being the only one standing up? Do you reject that the other two are standing up? No, no, I don't reject that. In that case, I'm not making Khalid unique in standing up. I'm sat there saying, well, maybe the other two are standing up too as well. The only way to do Tawheed would be affirmation and negation. That's what the kalima is, the shahada. La ilaha illallah. There is no deity worthy of worship in truth. Negation, all of them. Illallah, except Allah, affirmation. Now you have Tawheed. That's exactly what Allah told us in so many places in the Quran. When the prophets used to say to their people, Ya qawm. يَا قَوْمِ عَبُدُ اللَّهِ مَا لَكُمْ مِنْ إِلَهٍ غَيْرُ They used to say to their people, O oh people, worship Allah. This is an affirmation. Affirm the worship to Allah. مَا لَكُمْ مِنْ إِلَهٍ غَيْرُ You do not have any other deity deserving of worship. That is negation. They told them, worship Allah alone. Negate it from all others. You don't have any other deity worthy of worship. When Allah said, وَلَقَدْ بَعَثْنَا فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةِ الرَّسُولَ أَنْ يَعْبُدُوا اللَّهِ وَاشْتَنِبُوا الطَّاغُوتِ The prophets and messengers, they used to say to their people, أَنْ يَعْبُدُوا اللَّهِ اعْبُدُوا اللَّهِ Worship Allah. Affirmation to worshiping Allah. Then, وَاجْتَنِبُوا الطَّاغُوتِ and abstain and stay away from all of the false deities. Negation. In the Quran, Allah said, Allah, worship Allah. Affirmation, worship Allah. Then, and do not associate any partners with him. Negation. Negation. That is the way Tawheed works. Anybody asks you what is Tawheed? Tawheed is to make Allah single and unique. Our worship to him single and unique. How do we do that? By affirming it all to Allah and negating it from all others. That's the basis of Islam. That is the bottom line. All of the people out there then, when you think about it now, how many people still believe you can go to the graves and make dua to the dead people? Allah tells you in the Quran, worship him, nobody else. Dua, is it an act of worship or not? Dua is worship. Making dua is an act of worship. So how is it permissible to go and give it to somebody else? This is the core. So now when you think about Tawheed, there are three main areas of Tawheed. There are three main areas of Tawheed that are mentioned all throughout the Quran and the Sunnah. You have the scholars as they've explained, Ar-Rububiyyah, the Lordship of Allah. That is the Tawheed of Allah in His actions. The Tawheed of Allah in His actions. Meaning, there are certain things that you affirm Allah does them and only Allah does them and you negate them from all others. Like what we've been saying, creation. Who created all of the heavens and the earth? You affirm that was Allah and you negate that anybody else, anything else, had anything to do with the creation of the heavens and the earth. So you've now singled out Allah in that action of creation. Giving life and death, 
who is the one alone who gives the life and death, you affirm it to him, to Allah. And who else can do that? No one. So you negate it from all others. Now you've made the act of giving life and death singled out and unique as an action of Allah. Who provides for us the food, the drink, the sustenance, the provisions? You affirm that is only Allah. Nobody else negate it from all others. So that is making or performing the tawheed of Allah in terms of his actions. His action of creation, he alone. His action of giving life and death, he alone. His action of providing for us, he alone. Sending the rain, he alone. All of these are actions we affirm only Allah does them and we negate them from all others besides him. They mention a story about a man once. He said to his people, I can do that. I can create as well. He said, no, this is not the affirmation negation to Allah alone. I can create too, he said. So he got a jar, like a jam jar. Inside the jar, empty jar, he put some rotting vegetables inside. Some rotting vegetables and some rotting old meat. Closed the jar up and he said to them, is there anything alive in the jar? He said, rotting vegetables, rotting meat, nothing alive in there. He said, tighten, closed. Watch in a day, we'll come back. I will have created life in there. So when they came back, next day, all of a sudden, now he picks it up. Nobody's opened it. He says, look. And now when they look, they can see movement inside of the jar. Now inside of the jar, there are maggots. Because of the rotting vegetables, the rotting meat. There are maggots in there. He says, look how I have created life in this jar. So then they say there was a smart boy in the audience. There was a smart boy in the audience. So the smart boy said to him, all right, so if you've created this life in this jar, we can see all of them moving around. They're alive, obviously. You've created this life, you claim. How many of them did you create exactly in there? How many are there inside that jar now? Now you can see them moving everywhere, here, there, inside, outside, in the rotting meat, vegetables. He can't count them. He doesn't know how many there's in the jar. So the boy says, if you created them, how do you not know how many you created? You created them, but you don't know how many you created? You lost count? Then the boy said to him, if you claim you created them, you gave life to them, then when will you give death to them? Since you are the creator, you say. Again, he doesn't know. Maybe they'll survive a week in there. Maybe they'll survive two weeks in there. Who knows when they'll all die? So he doesn't know again. So the boy says, you gave them life, but you don't know when you're going to give them death. You can't work it out. So now he proved to the people the man is a liar. He did not create that life. That is the life that Allah created. That is from the, the rotting meat and vegetables and the larvae and the, from the flies and the eggs and the maggots they come. So this act of creation and sustenance and provisions and life and death and control of the universe, we affirm all of those actions are only done by Allah. And we negate and reject anybody else has anything to do with those actions. So now we've made the tawheed of Allah in terms of his actions. That is called rububiya. Then you have the tawheed of Allah with our actions now. This one is called al-uluhiya. Al-uluhiya. The tawheed of Allah with our actions. How do we make the tawheed in terms of our actions Meaning that all of our worship that we do, whether it is worship in the heart, worship upon the tongue, worship upon the limbs physically, all of that worship we will affirm it and do it sincerely and purely only for Allah. And we will reject and negate 
that any of our worship is directed for anyone else besides Allah. So therefore now we make the tawheed of Allah with our ibadah. That is the tawheed of Allah with your ibadah. That you will do all of your worship, every type of your worship, purely for Allah. And you will reject that it should be done for anybody else besides Allah. The third category is Tawheed al Asma'i wa Sifat. The names and attributes of Allah. Allah has many names. He told us about them in the Quran and in the Sunnah. And Allah has many attributes. Many different things that Allah told us about Himself. We again affirm all of those purely to Allah and we negate them from all others. Affirmation, negation. With those three general areas of Tawheed, you'll notice they are in the Quran. That's where we've learned this from. That's how the scholars, they found out about this. It's in the Quran. So when you read Al-Fatiha, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. That all praise is due to Allah, the Rabb of all of that which exists. The Rabb of all of that which exists, meaning the one who, who is the Rabb, the one who created it all, the one who provides and gives food and water and gives life and death, that is the Rabb. So that's where the scholars have understood this Tawheed from. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. Those are what? Two of the names of Allah. Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. Names of Allah. And then Maliki Yawmiddin. Also you can say from the names of Allah, Malik. Iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nasta'een. You alone we worship, nobody else. You alone we seek aid and assistance from, nobody else. That is the tawheed of al-uluhiyya, we're singling out Allah with our actions. You alone, nobody else, we ask for help and assistance. You alone, nobody else, we do our worship. So you see it's there in al-Fatiha. Another example, al-Fatiha is right at the Start of the Quran. What's right at the end? قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ The same three examples are there too. All throughout the Quran, beginning to end. قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ Say that I seek refuge in the Rabb of all of the people. Rububiya. Then, قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ Malik nas Malik you could say al asma wa sifat Malik nas ilah nas ilah yani al ma'luh the one who is worshiped tawhid al uluhiyya so again you see the different types of tawhid there all throughout the Quran you see it those different types of tawhid so now for a Muslim to be a Muslim, you must have an understanding and acknowledgement and believe in all of those types of tawheed. The mushrikun at the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what was their issue? From those three types of tawheed, the first one, ar-rububiyyah, to single out Allah, make Allah unique in terms of His actions giving life and death and creation etc did they have a problem with that no they believed in that those mushrikun the kuffar that fought against the prophet ﷺ, the prophet ﷺ fought against them they used to believe allah is the creator allah is the provider allah is the one who controls everything they believed that yet they were still kuffar how come if they believed in rububiyyah even names and attributes wasn't a big issue but where was the big issue with them? Tawheed al-Uluhiyya. Because when it came to making the Tawheed of Allah with your actions, with their own actions, with their ibadah, with their worship, they would not do that. They would not affirm their worship only to Allah and negate it from others. 
They would affirm it to Allah, but they wouldn't negate it from others. So they would do it for Allah and they would do it for their statues and gods and everything else. Allah says in the Quran, وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَتَّخِذُ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ أَنْدَادًا يُحِبُّونَهُمْ كَحُبِّ اللَّهِ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَشَدُّ حُبًّا لِلَّهِ That there are those people, mushrikun, who take partners alongside Allah. They take partners, andadan, partners alongside Allah. يُحِبُّونَهُمْ كَحُبِّ اللَّهِ They love these others just like they love Allah. So they affirm their love for Allah, but have they negated it from the others? They have not. They affirm it to them too. And that is why they are upon shirk. Shirk is when they do worship to others besides Allah. So they are affirming their love for Allah, but at the same time they are affirming their love for their statues and idols too. Whereas Tawheed would mean you affirm your love for Allah and your worship for Allah alone and reject it from all of the other deities, all of the other so-called false deities, all of the idols, the statues, the graves, the shrines. You do not call upon them and make dua to them. Allah said in the Quran, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّاعِي إِذَا دَعَانِ That if they ask you about me, tell them I am close. I answer the dua of the one who calls upon me. Allah tells you, make dua to him, he answers your dua. Dua is an act of worship. So make that dua to Allah. Do not make the dua to the dead person in the grave, saying that he was a great Imam and a great pious person will make dua to him. He'll take our dua to Allah. Shirk. You are now not negating the worship from others. You're doing it. You're making dua to others besides Allah. And that is impermissible. As an example we probably mentioned in previous times. A person once came to the grave of the Prophet ﷺ. And he threw a letter inside. He came to the grave, to the Prophet's masjid, went to the grave, and there's like the type of bar things in front, but he got a letter and he poked it in, threw it in. Afterwards, the security at the end of the day, they came and they were clearing up and they found somebody had thrown a letter inside. So they picked up this letter, opened it up, at the top of the letter, there was a passport-sized photograph of the man who had thrown it in, his own photograph. And next to it, his name. He put his name and his own photograph. This is a true story. Then underneath, there was another photograph of his wife and her name. Then underneath, two or three more photographs of his children and their names. Then at the bottom of the letter, Ya Rasulallah, this is my family. You can see my family here. Ya Rasulallah, we're having some problems. We're having some financial problems. Some other difficulties, my wife, my children, you can see them there, O Messenger of Allah, please give us some help, madad, give us some help, give us some, some, some way to get us out of our problems, our family, you can see them there, we're in need, posted it into the grave thinking this is how you make dua. True story. This is the level of the problem in the Muslim ummah. That the people do not understand the very basic meaning of La ilaha illallah. They do not understand La ma'abuda bi haqqin illallah. There is no one to be worshipped in truth except Allah. You do not even go to the grave of the Prophet wasallam and make dua to him asking him. Not even there. Forget about all of the other graves. Not even the grave of the Prophet wasallam. You don't go there and make dua asking him. How do we know you can't do that? Because when the Prophet ﷺ was alive, the companions, if they wanted to make a dua sometimes for something, they would ask the Prophet. They would go to him and ask him, O Messenger of Allah, we have for example a drought. There is a drought, no rain for a long time. So do the istisqa, do the dua, do the prayer for us for the rain to come. 
They would go to him and ask him. And he would make the dua, he would do the prayer. And then it's mentioned in Bukhari, one time it happened, and when he did the dua, the rain came everywhere. So, when he was alive, the companions would go to him and ask him, make dua for us, when he was alive. When he died, did the companions still used to go to his grave and say, Ya Rasulullah, make dua for us for this, that, the other? Never ever. There isn't a single hadith anywhere. If anybody believes there is, they can bring it and show us. Bring it and show it to us. Not a single hadith that the companions used to go, O Messenger of Allah at his grave, make dua there, asking him for help with this, for that, never. In fact, there is a proof that they definitely didn't do that. In case somebody says, well, maybe there is some hadith, we've just not seen it. There is a proof that they definitely didn't do it. Because one time, it's in Bukhari this, one time, there was a drought, what happened? A drought happened, and this was after the death of the Prophet ﷺ now. He had died now. And a drought happened. So they wanted to make the dua, to do the istisqa, for the rain to come. When he was alive, normally they would have gone and, they used to go and ask him. Now he had passed away, and this drought happened, and they wanted somebody to make dua, and to do the prayer for the rain to come. Did they go to the grave of the Prophet ﷺ and ask him, or did they go somewhere else? Hadith in Bukhari. They went somewhere else. Who did they go to? Abbas. They went to the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ, Abbas. And they said, you are the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ, you were close to him, relative. You make the dua for us now. Why did they go to him? Was Abbas a prophet or a messenger? Was he better than the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ? No. So why did they go to him and they didn't go to the Prophet ﷺ? He was right there. They were in Medina, in the Prophet's mosque. They could have gone to him right there in the grave. Why didn't they go to him? Why did they go to somebody who is not at the same level as the Prophet ﷺ? Nowhere near, Abbas. Why? Why would they do that? Does it make any sense? They did it for a reason. What's the reason? But why did they not go to the Prophet ﷺ? Why would they go to Abbas? Because they knew now that he has died, it is against the Qur'an and the Sunnah for us to go and make dua at his grave and ask him to do the dua for us. They knew it's haram to do that. That's why they went to Abbas. If it was allowed, do you think the companions would have said, forget the Prophet ﷺ, let's go to Abbas? Would they have said that? Never, ever. If it was allowed to go to the grave of the Prophet ﷺ and still make dua at his grave, O oh Messenger, the rain, we need it, it's a drought, then they would have definitely done that. Why would they have decided, no, forget that, let's go to somebody else? Does that make any sense? Never. The only reason they went to somebody else was because going to the grave of the Prophet ﷺ wasn't even an option. It's not even allowed to do that. That's why they had to find a different way and that's why they went to Abbas. If that was allowed and it was an option, then why would the companions not take that option? The Prophet ﷺ. Does it make sense? Anybody has the option of the Prophet ﷺ and anybody else that you would choose the other person? They definitely would have chosen the Prophet ﷺ. But they didn't because it wasn't an option to go to the grave and make the dua to the grave after he's died. That wasn't an option. It's against Tawheed. That's why they went to Abbas. So that proves the Sahaba, they knew. The companions, they knew. You can't go to the graves of people and make dua and ask them to take your dua to Allah. Because people, what do they say? They say, look, we're sinners. I'm a sinner, you're a sinner. All of us do so many sins. How is Allah going to answer our dua? But this great imam, or as they will say, the great peer, this great imam, this maulana, he was a great, great man. Go to his grave, make dua there, maulana, take my, my dua, this and that, ask Allah to give me this, ask Allah to give me that. So like he's your middle man, because he's pious and righteous. So if he goes and asks Allah on your behalf, you think you have more chance of your dua being answered. That's what people think. They say, I'm, I'm such a bad person, my dua, how is it ever going to be answered? 
But the great imam in our mosque who died a few years ago, such a great imam he was. Let me go to his grave, I'll make dua, ask him to ask Allah for X, Y, and Z. And inshallah, that way there's more chance of my dua being answered. Little do they know that he will not hear a word they are saying to him in the first place. Quran tells you the dead do not hear you. You can go to the grave and make as much as you want, you won't hear a word. And even if he did, he is not able to take your dua to Allah and get it answered for you. That is something the mushrikun used to do. The mushrikun at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, what did they used to do? Exactly that. Exactly. Because Allah told us in the Quran, they used to say, مَا نَعْبُدُهُمْ إِلَّا لِيُقَرِّبُونَا إِلَى اللَّهِ زُلْفَى They used to say, we don't worship them, these dead people and idols and everything. Only, the only thing is, we want them to get us closer to Allah. So they are like middlemen between us and Allah, they will get us closer to Allah. That's what they used to say. هَؤُلَاء شُفَعَاؤُنَا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ they would say, these are our intermediaries between us and Allah. Our intercessors between us and Allah. We are sinners, but we go to them. They are respected with Allah, pious. So we ask them, they take our dua, more chance for it to be answered. Wrong. That is just shirk. Calling upon others, asking them to take your dua from the dead in the graves, who cannot hear you or anything. Even the grave of the Prophet ﷺ, you don't do that. If that was to be done, how come there isn't a single hadith about it? If that was allowed, don't you think the companions every day they were there in Medina would have gone and made dua? Oh, Messenger of Allah, do this and ask Allah this and ask Allah that. Wouldn't they have gone every day? They were living right there in Medina. Not once did they do it. Why not? Because they knew it's haram. That's not something you're supposed to do. If it was allowed, they would have all done it and they would have gone every day. Why would they have missed that opportunity? They only didn't do it because they knew it's haram. So, Tawheed is to affirm all of the worship to Allah alone and to negate it from all others besides Allah. So when you pray, your prayer is for the sake of Allah alone and it is not for anybody else or for any other purpose. And that's why the scholars, they say, when you do your worship, then do it purely for the sake of Allah, not for the worldly benefits. Some people, they may do some worship to gain some worldly benefits or for the sake of showing off. There is that famous hadith about the three men, a man who used to go and fight in the path of Allah, and he was martyred. He got martyred. On the day of judgment, when it's his accountability, Allah will say to him, what did you do in the life? He will say, I fought for your sake. I fought for your sake, jihad, and I was martyred. And he was. But Allah will say to him, kathabt. You have lied. You're lying. How come? When he did actually get killed, fighting in the path of Allah. He only used to do it. It says in the hadith, إِنَّمَا قَاتَلْتَ لِيُقَالْ جَرِيْءٌ you only used to go and fight so people would say, look how courageous and bold you are. Look how brave you are. You just wanted people to praise you. That's why you used to go out and fight. That used to be his intention. So Allah will say to him, you're lying. You didn't get martyred in the path of Allah. You only got killed showing off in front of the people. You just wanted people to say, look how brave he is and how strong he is. And that's what they used to say about you. So him... He never did that action for the sake of Allah, thrown into the hellfire. In the same hadith it mentions, there was another man who used to learn about the religion, learn and learn Quran, everything about Islam, and he used to teach the people the Quran. So on the day of judgment, he will say, Oh Allah, I learned all of these things, and I learned the Quran, and I used to teach the people the Quran. And he did, he did used to do it. But Allah will say to him, Kathabt, you have lied. Because it says in the hadith, he only used to teach people Qur'an so that people would say, MashaAllah, what a beautiful reciter he is. He only used to do all of that to show off, to hold classes in teaching Qur'an and those things, just to show off to the people how beautiful his voice is, so everybody praises him. And that's what they used to do. So Allah will say to him on the Day of Judgment, you never used to teach the people for that. You used to teach the people to show off basically. That's the meaning of the narration. So he will be thrown into the hellfire. Third person on that day, 
a person who Allah had made rich in this world. So that person used to give in charity. He did everywhere. On the day of judgment, Allah will say to him, what did you do with the money that you were given? All those blessings of wealth. He will say, I used to give in charity everywhere. And he did. But Allah will say, كذبت. You have lied. You only used to give charity, liyuqal jawad. You only used to give the money so people would say, look how generous this man is. Look how generous all the money he gives everywhere. You were just doing it to show off. That's why he used to do it. That was his intention, really. So on the day of judgment, he will be thrown into the hellfire. So you look at those examples of people who didn't do their worship upon sincerity to Allah. Tawheed, making your action purely for Allah, not for the sake of the people, not for the sake of money or worldly benefits, but that you worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, singling out all of your worship purely for Him alone, sincerely to Him. As Allah mentioned, وَمَا أُمِرُوا إِلَّا لِعْبُدُ اللَّهَ مُخْلِصِينَ لَهُ الدِّينَ حُنَفَاء that they were not commanded except to worship their Lord alone, purely upon tawheed in sincerity. That is what we've been commanded to do. إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَّاتِ وَإِنَّمَا لِكُلِّ مِرْئٍ مَا نَوَى Every action is upon your intention. And every person will get what they intended. If you don't do your worship for the sake of Allah, you do it for other reasons, then don't expect reward. Instead, you may be punished for that. So a person needs to think about the reality and the foundations of Islam. In the day of judgment, you will be held accountable and you will be tested upon what you did in this world, what you did in this life, your actions, your deeds. When a person dies, that's it. إِذَا مَاتَ الْعَبْدِ إِنْ قَطَعَ عَنْهُ عَمَلُهُ إِلَّا مِنْ ثَلَاثِ When a person dies, all of your deeds, your chance, it's gone. Just three things stay. صَدَقَةٍ جَارِيَةٍ وَعِلْمٍ يُنْتَفَعُ بِهِ وَوَلَدٍ صَالِحٍ يَدْعُو لَهِ Ongoing charity you gave, that will carry on getting reward for you. A righteous child that you leave behind who makes dua for you, reward for you. And the knowledge that you leave behind and people benefit from it, reward for you. Everything else, in قَطَعَ عَنْهُ عَمَلُهُ All of your deeds will be cut off and you die. This is the chance only. In the other narration it mentions, يَتْبَعُ الْمَيِّتَ ثَلَاثَا أَهْلُهُ وَمَالُهُ وَعَمَلُهُ فَيَرْجِعُ اثْنَانِ وَيَبْقَى وَاحِدُ يَرْجِعُ عَمَلُهُ يَرْجِعُ أَهْلُهُ وَمَالُهُ وَيَبْقَى عَمَلُهُ Three things will follow a dead person to his grave. His money, his wealth, his family, and his actions, his deeds. Two of them, they come back. The family buries him and comes back. He hears their footsteps as they walk away. And his money comes back, taken by the inheritors. The only thing that will stay with you then is your actions, your deeds. That is what you will be held accountable upon. And all of those actions and deeds must be done upon Tawheed. That is why the five pillars of Islam, the first one is Tawheed. La ilaha illallah. Because imagine now if a person didn't accept, didn't believe in Tawheed. He didn't do affirmation negation, doesn't believe in that. Even if that person prays five times a day all his life, gives zakat every year, fasts Ramadan every year, even manages to go and do hajj, none of it will be accepted. He'll be in the hellfire in the afterlife. If he rejects, he rejects the shahada, the first pillar, the other four pillars will count for nothing. All of Islam is built upon the shahada, the tawheed. All of your actions must be done upon that. You know, in the time of Ali ibn Abi Talib, Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu, when he was the Khalifa, there was a group of Shia at that time too. And they began to say, Ali radiallahu anhu is so big and powerful and he's got some type of God in him. They started to say he's like a God. Some Shia at the time of Ali radiallahu anhu, Ali ibn Abi Talib. They started to say he's like a god. So when they started to say that, and there were people who were claiming to be Muslim, they were praying, they were fasting, they were going to the mosque, everything, but they began to have this aqidah that Ali radiallahu anhu is like some type of god. He has some types of godship in him. When they started to believe that, 
Ali ibn Abi Talib, and all of the other companions were agreed. Ajma'u ala kufrihim. All of the companions were agreed these people are kuffar. How can they say Ali has godship in him? How can they say Ali is like a god? All of the companions, Ali included, gave the ruling that they are kuffar. And they killed them. Ali ibn Abi Talib killed them for saying that. For them believing that he is like Allah. That he has some, some godship in him. And there are examples like that in other times too. In the times of the Egyptians and the Moroccans in the early centuries, there was the uh, Bani Ubaid al Qaddah. They used to uh, believe in Islam and everything generally, prayer, adhan, jama'ah, all of it. They used to do it all. But they started to reject some ayat of the Quran and some other parts. So the scholars of that time, those centuries ago, all of them again agreed these people are kuffar. How can you reject ayat of the Quran or reject this or reject that? So a person needs to understand. Don't just think, I say, la ilaha illallah, that's it, I'm safe. You need to understand what it means. The conditions of la ilaha illallah, tawheed and the basics of it, the affirmation, the negation. That's why there are really good books like Kitab al-Tawheed of Sheikh Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab. Kitab al-Tawheed, 60 odd chapters, goes through one by one the different aspects of Tawheed. The different aspects of Tawheed, one by one. So those are the types of books you need to become familiar with. So that as Muslims, we are not just Muslims by name, that we actually understand the reality of our religion. Somebody comes and asks you, what is the reality of Islam? What is the Shahada? What is Tawheed? You should be able to explain that properly. If you cannot explain that properly, then what are you upon? What, what kind of Muslims are we if we don't know what La ilaha illallah is properly? We don't know about this affirmation, negation, and tawheed. These are basics we must understand and know. So that is what we're going to round off on today. Is there any questions or anything to add to that? Prophets and messengers, there are differences between them. Some scholars, they say that a prophet was given the revelation but not commanded to preach it. But that is not the accurate opinion. Accurately, prophets and messengers, all of them were given wahi. Prophets and messengers, the Nabi and the Rasul, all of them, they were given wahi. They were given revelation and they were told to go and preach it. But the difference is, a Rasul... The messenger is given a new revelation. Whereas the prophets, they were given the old revelations. The same old revelation, they were given again and told to go teach it again. Whereas the messengers, when they came, they used to be given fresh new revelations. So when Isa alayhi salam came, a new revelation. Muhammad alayhi salam came, new revelation. Before that, Ibrahim alayhi salam, new revelation. Nuh alayhi salam, new revelation. But the prophets in between, they used to get the same older revelation to teach again. So that's one difference between prophets and messengers. And there are a few others as well. Anything else? This is not a category of Tawheed, al hakimiyah That comes into the three categories. That Allah has the rulership. Allah has the rulership, then is that not part of al rububiyyah is it not part of Allah being the Lord that He has the control, the, the rulership, the judgment? All of that is for Allah, part of the rububiyah of Allah. People want to try and make that into a separate category because they have problems with issues of takfir and they want to declare Muslim rulers as kuffar and they, you know, they're upon that deviated type of understanding and they think people like Anwar al-Awlaki and these people were good and they were takfiris, kharijis, khawarij. Most of those types of people are the ones who want to talk about al hakimiyah and these things. That is not a category the scholars have ever mentioned from the three categories. Anything else? Yeah, the young woman when the Prophet migrated from Mecca, from Mecca mm. was it purely based on La ilaha illallah that is the dawa according to the Prophet or was there other factors in that that the Quraysh came to make the no, the core, the core factor was that. Anything else was only secondary. The core issue the Quraysh had with the Prophet ﷺ was the fact that he was telling them, you must abandon and negate 
all of these other deities. That was the issue. When he first came and gave da'wah, the Prophet ﷺ, the Quraysh initially didn't catch on. When he first started giving da'wah and told them, you must all be upon Tawheed, the Quraysh thought initially that they are upon Tawheed. Because they didn't realize you have to do affirmation and negation of all of these. That this intercession with the idols and the dead is shirk. They didn't understand that was shirk. But when the Prophet ﷺ clarified to them, you going to these idols and these statues, that is the shirk I'm talking about. Then they started the enmity against the Prophet ﷺ. When he said to them, قُولُوا لَا إِلَهِ اللَّهِ Say that there is no deity worthy of worship in truth except Allah. They said, what? You want us to only worship one and abandon all of these? That's strange. Their issue was the tawheed. That is what their enmity against the Prophet ﷺ was. So they began to say, he's a madman, he's a magician, he's this, he's that. They didn't want to leave their religion of shirk. His own uncle, Abu Talib, when Abu Talib was dying on his bed, the Prophet ﷺ said to him, قُلْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ يَا عَمْ My uncle, say, لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ Say that there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah. But in the end, the mushrikun were convincing Abu Talib, don't say it, don't say it. In the end, Abu Talib, the last thing he said before dying was, that he's going to stay upon the religion of his forefathers. Because in Al-Bidaya wa Nihaya of Ibn Kathir, uh, Abu Talib, he wrote some lines of poetry that are attributed to him. He said, Was it not for the blameworthiness, was it not for the blameworthiness of the people and my forefathers, then I would have accepted. Meaning he didn't want to leave the religion of shirk, because of that connection to their forefathers and always worshipping idols and everything, all of them were upon that culture, upon that connection of shirk, their fathers and their grandfathers, and they couldn't leave that away. They couldn't break off from that. So when the Prophet ﷺ came telling them, you have to, it's shirk, you'll be in the hellfire, then that's their fight against the Prophet ﷺ. All the other things are only secondary. The root of the issue is that, the da'wah of tawheed and their da'wah of shirk. All right, we'll conclude upon that for today then. Uh, it appears that some of these stations have now been set up. All of these are live now. So there is a Twitter account, Tawheed Rochdale. Uh, these lectures that we do, they are broadcast live on the Mix LR channel, Tawheed Rochdale also. And they are uploaded onto the internet if you want to download later and listen to them on SoundCloud. Tawheed Rochdale as well. Uh, also, if you want to get updates and you should uh, sign up to this particular number, you can uh, do it with the brothers afterwards. Sign up to this uh, WhatsApp group and you'll get the messages about what time the class is going to be because this is not the fixed time. This was temporary for now. We're going to try and fix a time regularly afterwards. So sign up to the WhatsApp group or the text message group. And so you'll get the messages about when the class is going to be, what time, etc. in future. So, inshallah ta'ala, do that now. Here's the paper. You can speak with the brothers. Uh, and we'll uh, organize the next one and advertise it on these channels uh, until that time, inshallah.